If a John Fung were still alive, he'd be 105 years old. He was born in early May. As a child, all he knew that he was born in the week leading up to Wisaka Bucha. Later in life, when he was in Bangkok, someone had the idea of taking him to see an astrologer and do a reverse horoscope. Looking at the events of his life and then figure out from those events which day he'd been born. It was either the 4th or the 5th of May. So it was either yesterday or today was his birthday. Perhaps. He was born in a very poor family. It's one of those cases where you looked at the outside details of his birth and there wasn't much to give hope. He was orphaned at the age of 11. Prior to that time, one main memory he had of his childhood was that they had a cow. The cow gave birth to a calf, and he raised the calf. And finally they were able to sell the calf for some money. And so he had some money as a little child. And then he got very, very sick, and the money was all used up by his, the medicine for his illness. Then a few years later his mother got sick, a few years later after that his father got sick, they both died. So at age 11 he found himself a temple boy. That was a pretty rough life. We tend to think of temple boys as having a religious education, but it's basically kids without parents, subject to whatever the abbot or the monks at the monastery would inflict on them. The very first place he was sent, the abbot sounded pretty sadistic. He beat the kids quite a lot. And if any kid was caught trying to run away, he'd get beaten really badly. They'd tie him, he'd tie him up to a rafter, hanging down from a rafter with a rope, and beat him to the other, for the other kids to see. So John Fung decided this was not for him. So one day after school, instead of going back to the monastery, he went back to his relatives and said, I'm not going back there. So he was sent to another monastery. There he was sent to school again. But every morning he had to leave school in order to fix, fix food for the monks for their 11 o'clock meal. And as he said, he liked to put a little bit of marijuana in the, in the curry for them. So it was, they would nap nicely in the afternoon. <laughs> One of the monks tried to teach him music, but he had no musical talent. The abbot tried to teach him medicine. The abbot was the village doctor. But all that John Fuhn could see was that you were at everybody's beck and call all hours of the day and night. He had to go along as his assistant for a while, carrying medicines, carrying this or that. It wasn't until he was 16 years old that he actually started listening to the Dharma that was being preached and began to reflect on his life. Here he had nothing, not much of an education, no family he could depend on. He was going to have to develop some perfections. So when he was old enough, he decided to ordain. Now that was back in the days when they were beginning to have some textbooks that actually explained what was in the Pali Canon. Prior to that, if you studied in a monastery out in the countryside, who knows what you'd learn. In the early 20th century, Bangkok was producing some textbooks. And so he was reading about the Vinaya and began to realize that his life there at the monastery had very little to do with the rules of the Vinaya. He was beginning to get discouraged. So he gave himself two years. He said if at the end of the two years he hadn't met anybody who really inspired him, he'd disrobe. Well, fortunately, during his second range retreat, he met a John Lee. And John Lee had come to Chandaburi. And so every day he would go and listen to a John Lee's Dharma talks, ask him questions, talk with him, then go back and stay at his monastery and try to live the life of a one meal monk, meditating. He'd go for alms around and instead of joining the other monks for the eleven o'clock meal, he'd go into the ordination hall, spend the day doing walking and sitting meditation. At the end of the rains, he and one other monk decided to see 
if they were up for the life of a forest monk. So they wandered through the, the province there in Chandaburi. Finally got to this one mountain. It's called Kaumunkot, which means Maze Mountain. I visited one time with the John Fuhrn. We took a trip to visit his home village. And on the way there, we stopped off and said, this is where I decided that, yes, I would ordain in the Dhammyut order. Be a forest monk with the John Lee. The other monk, had, at that point, had decided this was too much for him, so we went back. So John Fuhrn returned to Chandaburi told a John Lee of his intention. And that was back in the days when the relationship between Dhammyut and Mahanikai were very touchy. And the chief Dhammyut monk in the province didn't dare reordain a Mahanikai monk as a Dhammyut monk for fear of the, the backlash. So John Lee said he was ready to take a John Fung into Bangkok. He knew some monks in Bangkok would ordain him. Finally, the chief monk of the province gave in. And so John Fuang was able to join the John Lee. And there, he said, that's where he learned the brightness of life. One of my favorite stories of his early time with the John Lee is they, were, they went on two dome together one time with several other monks. And some of the other monks were carrying a John Lee's umbrella tent in his bowl, his bag of provisions, well, not provisions, but his bag of things he needed, and they're in the forest. And the John Fung realized if you're going to keep up with the John Lee, you'd have to just follow right in his footsteps. You couldn't let yourself fall back, because otherwise you'd lose him, which is exactly what happened. All the other monks got lost. And so when the evening came, he and John Lee found themselves on a mountaintop with nobody else around. So John Fuang set up his umbrella tent. The two of them shared the umbrella tent that night. He massaged John Lee's legs a little bit, then sat and meditated. He thought of a passage in the canon where they talk about the monk who travels with his bowl as his only burden in the same way that a bird flies with its wings as its only burden. felt a great sense of freedom. The next morning they, he went down to a village nearby. He went for alms, came back, he split the food, and John Lee ate the food out of the bowl, and John Fung ate out of the bowl. It was only after the meal was over that the other monks had caught up with him. So I basically lived with a John Lee for twenty years until the John Lee's death. They were going to make him abbot of a John Lee's monastery, and he decided that's not what he wanted. So he went off. First spent some time at Wamakun in Bangkok, spent some time at a monastery up in Lopurdi. Finally settled at Watamasadit, and it was very remote, very secluded. And yet over time, people found him. He was never a famous teacher, but he had a very devoted group of students. He was able to accomplish a lot. There are lessons you can learn from his story. One is you can't judge people by their birth, the details of the birth. I remember going to his home village. It was really poor. I remember he talked one time about the ordination hall at the monastery there. He said it had a really nice mural. Up on the up on the ceiling. A mural of samsara. Well when we actually got to saw it, it was pretty it was pretty sad. But you imagine for a little kid born out in the countryside it was it was something. And was born into a place with a lot of misunderstandings about the teachings. The word for nirvana in Thai, Nipan, is very close to Himapan, which is the name for the Himalaya mountains. So when he was young, he, he thought that that's, where, that's what the practice was for, was to go to the Himalaya mountains. So 
a lot of misunderstandings he had to work through, but he was able to do it. As he decided that time when he looked at his life, if his life is going to have any meaning at all, he's going to have to work on his perfections. In the later years of his life, he happened to go up north one time. Met a, a woman that he hadn't seen for many decades. She had been a supporter of a John Lee and moved, moved up north. Now was a grandmother. And so the woman invited him to give a Dharma talk to her children and grandchildren. And the theme of the talk was, what are you born for? Who are you going to take as your model for what's a good life? If you're born for material pleasures, material wealth, it's not going to last. The only thing you can really hold on to are the perfections. That way, no matter what condition you're born in, there's a passage where the Buddha talks about being born in darkness and going in light, being born in light and going into light, being born in darkness and going in darkness, being born into light and going into darkness. The darkness and where you're born has to do with the material and other circumstances into which you're born, but where you go has to do with what you make of your life. So what you're, how you're born doesn't matter, it's how you go. As John, Lee, excuse me, as John Fuhring said, the Buddha decided he was going to be born for the sake of the perfections every time he took birth. So that's a good vow to take on, that no matter where you're born, you're, you're going to be born for the sake of the perfections, for the sake of developing your generosity, your virtue, your powers of renunciation, your discernment, your persistence, your endurance, your truth, your determination, your goodwill and your equanimity. These things, if you develop them, Make your birth worthwhile, because here we are born. What happens after birth? Well, there's aging, illness, and death. That's for sure. But above and beyond that, what do you actually want to get out of life? What do you want to gain from all the pain that comes from having to be born? We've all been born in relative comfort. But that's not what gives life meaning. It's what you do with it, how you dedicate it. And this is the story of all the Taijans. Most of them were born in pretty poor circumstances. But as John Mun taught them, simply the fact that you're a human being, you're already in the supreme position for awakening. Agatande Simunasesu. It's in the human birth that the highest, highest foundation for the practice is, is found. But it doesn't matter whether you're poor or rich, male, female, what's your background? You've got the potential within you. to work on your perfections, to work for the sake of awakening. That's what gives your life meaning. As John Fung said, if he hadn't found a John Lee, he probably would have been a small-time gangster. We never would have heard of him. But because he gave himself to the perfections, he's become an example to all of us. So you ask yourself, here you are born. What's next? Think about the Buddha's memory of his lifetime. So there's birth, pleasure, pain, feeding, death. That's the common 
common course of life each lifetime, or if you want to make it uncommon, you can do so by developing the perfections. The choice is yours. <laughs>